Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be with you this afternoon for uh, being the moderator of this uh, important panel about peace, which is very much fitting within the agenda of the Paris Peace Forum. Uh, with me, uh, three speakers, uh, three panelists of a high level of competence and also experiences on the ground. Uh, Bert Kunders, for, uh, Foreign Minister of the Netherlands, but many more than this, including Special Envoy of the United Nations uh, and uh, of the World Bank. Uh, then uh, Paula Gaviria, who who is not only the head of the of the foundation of, of the of the Gavis Foundation, but is also advisor to the former president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos. Then uh, Hiba Casas, who is uh, the head of the secretariat of uh, the principle for peace uh, inclusion and. Uh, as a part of this project, uh, which is Interpeace, which is a bit uh, the reason why we are here today to illustrate uh, this project, which is uh, not an easy one, because basically in a world full of uh, conflicts, you know, it tries to identify some, uh, let's say, normative uh, framework in order to help peacemakers, peacekeepers to, let's say, do it better and more importantly, to do in a way that it lasts. Now, my role is simply to moderate, therefore, I would like to give very quickly uh, the, the floor to the panelists. I would like to start with uh, Bert Kondes and uh, asking him, you know, we have today 52 active com uh, conflicts in the world. You know, it's a peaceful world, apparently, but in reality, it has 52. And we see, unfortunately, also every day that there are old conflicts which were supposed to be let's say, settled, or in any case, fixed, or less, uh, let's say, managed, which are falling apart, and therefore conflicts uh, are starting. Examples are in, in, in the Sahel, but not only, you know, look, look at what's going on in the Horn in these in these hours. Now, but why all this? What's, what's, what's wrong in what uh, the international community is doing, has done, in order to set up peace uh, and lasting peace? Well, thank you, Stefano, and, and thank you for inviting me to this, this very important forum and, and asking these questions, which really keeps me up at night, frankly. Because you are right, we see a world with a new type of conflict, proxy warfare, without a complete neglect of humanitarian law of principles. And we are seeing an, an, an historic increase in violent conflict. And all of us who've worked on this uh, realize that um, if you look at those figures and the work that has been done, there must be something fundamentally wrong in the way we do it so far, because we are not only confronted with more conflict, most of the peace processes that we see fail after seven to 12 years. Uh, I was <laughs> representative in, in, in Mali, and we know that uh, in, in, uh, in, in that country, there were four peace processes. And the one we see right now is actually also at risk. Uh, if you look to all the conflicts we have right now, more than 90% were in countries that experienced civil wars previously. And many of the peace agreements are not implemented. There are many reasons for that in my short term, but this is also something for the discussion. First of all, I think many of these processes have overemphasized what is very important, by the way. I mean, I've been negotiating in Algiers and in, in Ouagadougou and so on and so forth, short-term conflict resolution. But we realize, and we knew that also, but we don't often know the mechanisms and the, and, and the principles to establish sustainable peace. And if you look to different countries, we all, always uh, tend to look at the short term to stop the violence. But we forget to look often at the illegal economy 
uh, the protection of civilians and local communities, not for one day, not for 10 days, but for months to create confidence. We forget to look at issues of governance. I mean, if we look to Mali, we're in 60 years of independence. We have now the fourth coup d'etat. And we understand then that the sustainability of what Benjamin has agreed is somehow uh, at risk. Second, I think we, we fix ourselves very often on negotiations at the table. Again, I said this is very key, but many actors are not involved in a systematic way. And uh, of course, with newer principles, we'll have to work not only with women and youth just for a few days during the peace negotiations, but really listen and see how the sustainability of what we can do can actually be enhanced by them. I can give you, as anybody else on this forum, a lot of examples of youth groups who are starting to administer things during war, but then they're forgotten at the moment there is short-term conflict resolution. The whole issue of buy-in and inclusivity is much more key than we just say in our uh, papers and in our lessons learned. What strikes me also is often the lack of oversight and financing of implementation. Um, I just was looking at the peace agreement now in Sudan, very important, with two of the uh, uh, groups in, in, in Darfur. Very important that this has been done. But again, if you look to the financial figure, the lack of money, the enormous demands that are on the process, we should be able to do better this time to make sure that it's inclusive and long term. Um, then I think uh, maybe the most important one why we have to look to innovative principles and ways of doing uh, inclusive peace is that we normally still have our toolbox of peacekeepers, of uh, different experts, uh, of a so-called holistic approach. But in fact, we push our uh, policies standard on a country. We still do that. I still look at the lack of knowledge often of the historical grievances uh, of, of, of what's happening in the country. And in a time that we are living uh, with worldwide corruption, uh, flows of money illegally, I think, uh, and I was faced with that in all the conflicts I was involved in peacemaking and mediation, a lack of instrumentalization what we do with the illegal economy. Uh, if, if you look to, to some of, 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 of where the, the, the places where really people have been hurt, where uh, civilians are not protected, it is almost always at the cornerstone uh, of where grievances, economic interests and the illegal uh, economy come together. So I think uh, that's also a very key important uh, issue of oversight in, in, in the present way that we do things. And therefore, I think it is absolutely important uh, that we fundamentally uh, think together to do this. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bert. Maybe we can uh, further elaborate later, due to your experience also, to address the specific case. By the way, I would like also to recall to the audience that there, is, uh, there will be a question and answer session at the end. So please uh, raise questions because you have the opportunity to a protagonist here. And therefore, you can ask concrete things also concerning uh, the experience on the ground. Now, uh, Paula, um, now you've been working, you know, with the former president Juan Manuel Santos uh, to broken one of the most important agreements, actually, peace agreements, uh, putting an end or at least, uh, you know, trying to put an end to the war in, in Colombia. And therefore, this agreement in 2016 has been hired, and rightly so, by many as, uh, let's say, not only a success in itself, but also as a sort of... Uh, let's say, example on how things can be done and then how things could be done in order to uh, keep it on, uh, on, on track. I had the, the pleasure and the honor to be closely involved into that from the, the European Commission side, and therefore I have watched from close, really, uh, the importance, the difficulty and the challenges which are now facing. Now, uh, four years after, you know, what is your assessment of uh, the implementation of this uh, agreement and uh, of the of, of the bottlenecks, let's say, which are most significant in order to bring it forward as uh, uh, it, it has been conceived since the outset. Please, Paula. Yes, Stefano, thank you very much. And uh, you give me a chance to thank you and the European Union for the great support that we had from you for the 
um, negotiation process and now the implementation process also from the ne Netherlands and many countries in the world. The international community was key for uh, the negotiations to come to a good term and now for the implementation. But I would have to say that the first challenge, challenge in Colombia continues to be a need to have a broad consensus uh, around the peace process, around what was agreed upon and uh, on what is needed to transform the conditions that allowed a conflict for, for so long to, to exist in Colombia. It was more than 50 years of a conflict. So uh, with this consensus, which is not easy, and we can talk about this later, uh, we need political will, and we need political will to promote the implementation fully, to guarantee that that implementation corresponds to the spirit of what was agreed upon, and obviously to generate the, 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 the necessary institutional and social changes to ensure the effectiveness and sustainability of the implementation. Um, in this line, a challenge that Colombia still has is related to the great imbalances and gaps that we have between the rural and the urban areas, uh, the, the great inequality that we have. There is a differentiated presence of the state in the rural context where access to public goods and services is very deficient. As long as these conditions do not change, it will be very difficult to consolidate a stable and lasting peace. And this requires overcoming also the institutional inertia uh, and requires obviously uh, the promotion of public agendas and policies that are aligned with the implementation of the peace process. Um, I would say those are the first challenges, but also there's a challenge re regarding the adaptation in a way of the spirit of the agreement and how to strengthen that spirit, but to adapt it and to bring it to the new realities of the Colombian post-conflict, we would say. So as you might know, because it's, this is very um, important in the human rights world and in Europe, it's, it's very sensitive. Uh, we have security threats. We have um, an increase of the number of the uh, illicit crops, uh, the illegal economies also that, that Bert was mentioning, uh, the current situation of threats for social leaders, of killings of former combatants of the FARC. And this all demands greater efforts to promote its implementation of, of the peace agreements. We believe that implementing the peace agreement will help to, um, to control all these situations that are, that are there. There's a whole system of guarantees and preventions contemplated in the agreement that will help the territories to, 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 to move forward. And at the end, and this is like the hat that I used to have at the end of the government of President Santos, human rights. This is about having a human rights approach to the implementation, to have also a territorial approach. This is happening in the ground. It's not happening in the cities. It's not happening in Bogota. This is there. And also, which I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's talking about the inclusivity that we can um, uh, go into depth uh, later, the participatory approach, like the ownership that citizens in Colombia have to have. This is very key in the agreement, the participation of victims, obviously, but of different actors that feel that this is part of their own um, way to contribute to the transformation of Colombia. This is the territorial participatory approach of the agreement that for us is the only way to have, and the human rights approach that I was saying, to have a long and lasting peace in Colombia. So I would, I would, I would leave it there, Stefano. These are some of the challenges, as you might know, that the Colombian process has. Thank you, thank you very much. Now, Hiba, um, I mean, you, you, you can a bit build on what Bert and Paula said, because Bert basically put the accent on, let's say, the, in the, the lack of effectiveness when the approach is a short-term fixing based, essentially, and uh, Paula put the accent uh, on the necessity of the complexity of the actors, uh, of the knowledge, you know, of all what is, uh, is necessary in order to have a wider approach, but which at the same time should become uh, essential to, to fix, however. So, therefore, there is these two elements. Now, uh, I mean, precisely because you are ahead of the secretary of, uh, the, of these principles, you know, I think that on all sides it is necessary that there is more action on the ground informed, but also a certain way to frame that in, in a sense. So therefore, what is in your view, in your experience, in your thinking, you know, this sort of matching between the two, the two principles which can precisely uh, help in guiding 
I mean, the work and even the consensus which could be built around this. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano, for that. Um, just to build perhaps on the points of uh, that Bert and uh, Paula have raised and how these different um, uh, fundamental flaws in our current approach build and manifest themselves in the adequacy of, of the international toolbox um, of, of peace and security interventions. I think it's, it's, it's really safe to say that the current global um, crisis and the poor track record that we see manifesting um, around the world um, is founded in at least additional three areas, if I, if I would like to, uh, to complement. One, uh, and this is really applicable if we're talking about peacekeeping or uh, stabilization or mediation or DDR or SSR. Um, the first one is how mandate driven the interventions continue to be rather than uh, problem driven. Often we see, and I think uh, Bert uh, alluded to that already, in terms of how we see a set of scriptures that get followed in different countries. And I've seen this at play when I was working in the humanitarian field or in the peace and security field, where you could remove literally the name of one country from a humanitarian response plan, put the name of another country and the interventions look very much the same. And the second, um, the second aspect is around the short attention span, both of the international community and the different parties who are engaged um, in, these, in these processes. And the third is around how um, the approach uh, of the international community has not really evolved with the time. We seem to be with, with the structures and the, and the approaches that are uh, proposed and continue to be deployed to the test of reality that we are not seeing them necessarily um, resulting in, in an improvement or in a in, in sustainable lasting peace with the statistics that we see, but we still continue to see that we are still proposing the same approaches of the 70s and 80s which have not been which have not necessarily been successful. And the way these three factors manifest themselves then in, in the points that uh, both Bert and, and, and Paula spoke about, it's, it's very, very clear. In the fact, in the last two decades, 90% of peace processes happened in countries that already experienced some form of, of civil war. I think of Yemen, Sudan, DRC, Sierra Leone, I can go on and on about that. And that is mainly driven by the fact that we have a short-term approach to, uh, to negative peace, which is what uh, uh, Beth was speaking to. The fact that we tend to see uh, uh, an emphasis on quick fixes, uh, that we're not necessarily going deep enough to address the root causes of the grievances, and how in many of these conflicts that we see today, there are manifestations and, and transmutations of old conflicts. And the fact that 140 peace processes globally between the, the 90s and 2015, only less than 1% of these agreements aim to solve conflict in a substantive and comprehensive way. The fact that we also see a methodological problem with uh, overemphasizing the negotiations on the, on the table. And this is very clear. And one can argue that South Sudan is a case in point recently that um, some argue that uh, the negotiations table model in many cases create, if not balanced with other tools, can create uh, an elite dominated power sharing arrangement that the only way you could ensure a seat on the table is through violence. And sometimes we could see this uh, affecting different levels of, of violence. In South Sudan, some can argue that the increase in violence at the local level in contrast with uh, with the level of the of the usual actors uh, or the main opposition party, is is a case um, in point in that the lack of inclusivity and local ownership, which I think the broad consensus that Paula spoke about, is very very um, important. And we see again that even with the improvement of the international community's normative commitments, we are still stuck at tokenism. Uh, and we're not reaching strategic inclusion. It's about who's relevant to what process and how we engage these. The issue, Stefano, is that we know what the problem, what the problems are. The question is, why aren't we seeing a shift? These problems are not news. We've seen them repeating again and again and again. But how can we shift? And this is what we're trying to do um, with, this, with this initiative. What we're trying to do is really to launch a collective effort of the whole uh, sector, a collective effort that would 
support both national and international actors to rethink how we're approaching peace processes. How can we address these fundamental flaws? How can we move towards greater accountability and implementation? How can we change incentives of the different actors who are engaged to have a more longer term uh, impact? And how can we anchor all of this in the lived experience and aspirations of the people? Because what, what both Paula and Bert spoke about in terms of this broad consensus, who, then the question is that whose piece it is and how much will it last and how is it going to be implemented? We need to bring in this approach of real politic with real society. People, and we see this rising around the world, people are speaking up, you see the rise of leaderless social movements. There is a desire and a demand by the people for their voices to be heard. So we need to create that bridge between these voices and aspirations for peace and the power institutions and the states and enable these capacities. And I think the ambition is to engage in a collective process. And I can tell you more later on because I'm conscious of time about how we intend to do that. But it's, it's really about creating a whole new energy and momentum to make this shift and move to the sustainable outcomes that we all desire and which the people deserve. And it's high time to reach. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Iba. Uh, I, I, we will have, a, I'm trying to connect a bit, I mean, what you said in order to make it lively. By the way, there is a number of questions which are arriving, therefore, I will like just ask you to be a bit shorter in your reply in order then to give space uh, uh, for the for the public. Now, but, uh, you know, we, we, we have seen a bit the, this tendency of short termism, but the complexity of the inclusiveness, which is uh, very much said, but not necessarily done, also because of lack of knowledge, because it's difficult, because, you know, there is the, the always this tendency to negotiate, but not to build. So, a um, certain number of things. If you take this and we apply it to Mali, you know, a situation that you know very well, what uh, we should have done differently, you know, if, we, if you take this from this perspective? Well, if you look to the reality of Mali, uh, of course, we had the fourth coup d'etat, uh, just a few months ago in Mali. That, and, and, and the answer that we give to this in the international community is often doing more of the same. So uh, maybe if it didn't work out in Mali and there is still a lot of insecurity and a lack of protection of civilians and an expansion of, of jihadism and people, local communities that are being ethnicized and, and confronting each other, then we say we have to do exactly the same as we did before, namely more aid and more military support. And I think both of them are actually important, but it's not just more of the same. It's the way we're doing it and for whom we're doing it. If you look to the demonstration in Bamako a few weeks ago, which in the end led to the toppling of, uh, of uh, President uh, IBK, who was, of course, part and parcel of the negotiations I was involved in at the time, for the peace agreement, it's very clear that one issue was definitely not sufficiently dealt with. That's the issue of, and, 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 and Hiba and others mentioned it, inclusivity uh, and real sense that the population of Mali, including in Bamako, supported what was needed uh, in the peace process. And the, the fact is that in fact, I think about 70% of the commitments of the Algiers agreement were never implemented nor were the reforms, and like in Sudan, people rose up and wanted a different governance to deal with this peace process. So the first point is, it's not just more aid and military support when there are threats, it's the way you do it. The elite deal that we were talking about that is actually supported, is that something that is sustainable? And I hope the transitional government that is now uh, in Mali, will listen carefully to what was actually a very good effort a year ago, namely a real national dialogue uh, of the people in the north, but also of the center and the south on what should be done in terms of priorities. You can't do everything at the same time. It included both armed groups, and I think we have to talk to them, in, in, including in, in mid-Mali, but I know that quickly leads to sort of a diffusion of military uh, men around the table rather than the, the population. So they have to deal also with the outcome of this very well-organized 
uh, Mali national dialogue, which is something that is the pride and also the culture and history of Mali. So, of course, many things have been uh, done wrong, if you wish, but I think inclusivity and, and, and governance was one a key aspect. Uh, the second was don't do just more of the same, but put it in, in the end in the security long term of the communities. When we were working on the north, the problem started in the center. Uh, something must have been going completely wrong in terms of priorities. Uh, and I think we should be very critical about the nature of the agreement and the way they, they, they are brought in by the population. Last, last remark because of the time. Uh, both those principles that Hiba was talking about and this sort of innovation, I think, is key. So I very much support that. And secondly, in my own World Bank work at the moment as a special envoy in fragility, we very much look more at an, an intelligent way of, of dealing with the protection of communities, the support for basic services, and the way you can make that long term. And I'm sure that, that, that the colleague from, from Colombia can say much more about it. If you don't have the presence of the state and the presence also of local services, the void will be filled, and uh, mostly by big men with weapons. Thank you, Bert. Now, precisely, this is the perfect bridge to Paula. Uh, to what I would like to add, maybe uh, something uh, a bit a bit broader, but uh, equally specific. You know, uh, in the situation like the one of Colombia, you know, you have also not only to manage the difficulty of the process itself, the FARC, the other movement, the para the, the paramilitary movement, etc., within uh, let's say a political framework which was not only conducive but even determined. You know, to do this. But you have also to manage, you know, the presence of many international actors. By the way, this is a question which is raised by many in our in our chat line. You know, you know, and very often the international community is so fragmented, uh, interpreting uh, each of them in a different way. What are the stakeholders? What the inclusivity is? Uh, what the way to put ahead knowledge should be done? So. How you see this uh, in your experience, uh, how difficult this has been and which kind of suggestion you can give in order to, let's say, manage better the international community, which is willing to do many things. Uh, but then it, it could be also a factor of, the, of, of difficulty if not properly managed by, uh, by the country itself. Yes, I would say that um, in our in our methodology, the, the design that was made for the Colombian process, we had it very clear that the international com community was key. So they played a role in the negotiation, as as you know, as guarantors of the of the of the process in one way. Uh, but also, there were special envoys and all this that you all know about, which were key uh, for the. Um, not only the legitimacy of the process and uh, the assistance in a way, but for uh, the, the constant uh, relation to uh, past experiences. All that has been said already, what, was, what had worked, what had, didn't work. Uh, we're even working now in the, in the foundation that I, that I am the CEO from, which is the President Santos Nobel Prize Foundation. We are working on an open library of, of the peace agreement because we think that there are a lot of lessons learned from the Colombian process that are going to be added to all the work that you do around the world, uh, trying to um, give some insight to, to what has worked in the Colombian process that could help other processes. So this was key for us since the beginning, but in the implementation, it's, it's key as well. And as you had said, Stefano, in an organized way, uh, and that, as you know, in the agenda of the agreement, there's there's a uh, six uh, point of the agenda, which is about uh, implementation. And there's uh, like the definition of the role that the international community is going to play in that um, that process of implementation. And it has been key. It has been key. The European Union has been key for uh, the strengthening of the implementation regarding the rural areas of Colombia, the, the okay. point one of the agreement. That, that you have known that that's that's the key for the transformation, the territories. But also international community has been very supportive of one of the key aspects of the Colombian agreement, which I want to talk about, which is the concrete answers for the victims of violence related to their human rights abuses and violations. As you know, 
We have almost 9 million victims of conflict registered in the unique registry of the victims law, which I also had the, the chance to lead while I was in the government. And all these victims are, uh, for us, are the key actors of of this peace agreement. I mean, it's for them that this peace agreement in a way was firstly uh, done. And the um, international community has understood perfectly that the support that they can bring to the integral system for uh, justice, truth, and non-recurrence and to the, um, the unit that it's uh, searching for the missing uh, is key. But uh, b because there's there has been, as you might have known, um, some tensions around that, some tensions around the, the, um, the, the approach that the current government has given to this institution. So uh, international community has stood by like the spirit of the agreement and has said, we are going to support this in the name of the victims. And that has been key for the legitimacy of, this, of these institutions and for the, the feeling that the Colombian people have. They say, well, if the international community is so convinced that uh, the ways to support victims, that th there has to be like a reason why for that. So uh, mm -hmm. that has helped in the in the narrative because I think that's the other um, key that um, I, I don't think that we have spoken enough about. I mean, the consensus part that we spoke already, the inclusivity, but the inclusivity also has to deal with a specific narrative of the process. What is the common understanding of why we are undergoing this process. Why is this peace process so important for the transformation that Colombia needs, you know? So um, here, I think that's, that's the last um, key that I would give uh, now, uh, which is having a common understanding of the importance of what is at stake, mm -hmm. you know, what is at stake yes. and commit, obviously everyone commit to, to the response that has to be given to, to the implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Iba, uh, you have seen that there are a lot of practice, a lot of concept, even a lot of principle to be implemented, as uh, Paula just said, vis-a-vis -vis the international community and what uh, they wanted to do concretely in Colombia, which means, by the way, to have an interlocutor which is able also to do it, which was maybe... Uh, don't want to say easier in Colombia, but certainly strong in Colombia, maybe a bit less in Mali at a certain moment. Now, how you would you would codify all this? Because at the end of the day, this is precisely the objective of this beautiful project, eh, which is the, 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 the inclusive principle for, for peace, inclusive and lasting. So what, how you would codify it in few words, unfortunately? Great. No, thanks, Stefano. I mean, in a way, what we're trying to, to do is very much build on, on this collective wisdom that is emerging from the different lessons that come from different, from different countries, from different experiences, what work and what doesn't work. And the way we aim to do this uh, is through this new initiative, which is very exciting. Um, it's the Principles for Inclusive Peace Initiative, which uh, uh, actually the last uh, Paris Peace Forum gave impetus uh, to it, and we are we have been gearing up to launch. Um, what we will do within this within this initiative is that we will launch a global participatory and inclusive process um, to generate a collective effort for this fundamental rethink on how peace is understood and achieved. What we will be working towards is uh, the development of new sets of principles. Uh, that both will provide a frame of reference, but will also better enable local, national and international actors to craft more inclusive peace processes that would result in long-term sustainable peace. The way we, we attempt to, to do that um, is through a very participatory process. What we'll also aim to do is to generate this momentum uh, to create greater accountability and change some of the incentives of national and international actors who are engaged in this space um, for uh, more coherent peace building in interventions. So a lot of big objectives. Now the good news is that for these big objectives we have a very good strategy and the strategy combines both um, a, a pragmatic approach uh, of engaging and providing a, the thought leadership through an international commission of eminent persons which will be launched and announced next month. Uh, and I will not do spoilers to share about some of the amazing commissioners who will be uh, joining and who are joining the, uh, the commission. And the idea of this international commission is that they will provide the thought leadership 
but they will not be a traditional commission. This commission will spearhead um, the efforts uh, and a global participatory process, will focus global political engagement, but very importantly, will amplify local voices and, uh, and aspirations. And as Secretariat, we will be supporting their effort uh, to function not as a traditional commission, but to function as a listening commission and to anchor its work really in evidence and lived uh, experience. Uh, when I said a collective effort of the sector, uh, we are reaching out to, to the different organizations who are, who are in this space. And I'm very happy to see a lot of organizations who share our reading and are joining uh, this initiative to provide that evidence space and that sounding board um, and, and also their networks to support the work uh, of the Commission and to feed into this uh, wide participatory bottom-up and multi-stakeholder process that would feed into the development of these international uh, uh, principles for inclusive peace, which we will be working on over the coming two uh, years. We have uh, support both by the government of Sweden, the government of Denmark, government of Switzerland and the Robert Bosch Foundation and many other countries are joining this effort in different capacities and different modalities of, uh, of support. Uh, but we will work together as a collective uh, initiative towards also putting foundations for, for monitoring and accountability uh, to ensure that also when we set a set of principles as a reference point, that actually there is an uptake of these principles of what constitute uh, a peace process that delivers to the people and that lasts and really fulfills all of the points that both Paula and Beth uh, were speaking about in their interventions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Now, we, are, we have eight minutes, hmm? but there are a certain number of questions, and I uh, really apologize with the, with, the, with the audience if I cannot pick them up because there is no time. But I would like to take one very simple for Bert, you know, which is basically, you know, in our peace uh, activities, hmm? we are very much uh, uh, insisted on the quick fix, or in any case, uh, to stop, or in any case, to find something which is, uh, let's say, having a short-term, immediate, and visible solution. Now, in this context, which is uh, to be given the, let's say, the predominance, the quick fix, uh, and therefore stability, or democracy and inclusiveness? Is a question just for a couple of minutes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, it's a key question, um, and of course you would, and, and as, as we were talking about these, the importance of these principles, you would normally choose for the second, but obviously there are dilemmas involved. Uh, a quick fix never works, because we know that conflicts recur and recur, that peace, agreement can, peace agreements can be signed, but you don't know for how much years it will actually work. Uh, and in the case that I've been working on, and in many others as well, you see a recurrence of conflict. Uh, if you look to the real countries that were just mentioned, they come back into conflict every two or three years in different forms, but with similar grievances and underlying reasons. So quick fixes never work. It doesn't take away that sometimes you have to negotiate very quickly a cessation of hostilities uh, or a ceasefire uh, and going towards a peace agreement. But the devil is there in the details. I think that's absolutely the key. If it just uh, because we want to contain a conflict and uh, we want to make sure that it doesn't overflow uh, in terms of repercussions for other countries in terms of migration or terror or you know uh, going conflict over the borders yeah then often it is just a quick fix uh, and the short-term political uh, time span that leaders have both in the country itself the armed groups as well as the outside region and the world uh, that that will be the priority. I think there is another issue which we have to be faced with on, on quick fixes. I don't see even that many quick fixes anymore. Most, most people don't even you know, care about really what is happening underlying a conflict. Let's see how long we have been pestering on the wars in, in the Middle East at the moment. Uh, but I have to be sure there's much more to be said about it. But in the end, it's a second choice, of course, which is which is key. Thank you, Bert. Paula, uh, there, there is a question concerning the role of communication and communication tools uh, in this process, which is extremely important. The reference was made uh, to, to community radio, for example, but I would add also the use of internet, for example, but all the 
the communication side of uh, your experience, let's say, in order to reach out, uh, in order to explain, in order to counter sometime, in order to build alliances. So if you can elaborate a bit on this. Yes, I, I, I am convinced that communications is, is not a minor issue in the development of a peace process, uh, as, as I was saying about the narrative and the common understanding, but also obviously, and, and Eva might know and there's a lot about this, how the balance, the right balance between uh, uh, informing and communicating to the people about the, the, uh, the development of the conversations uh, and, 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 and obviously the transparency of the process for, for the citizens. Uh, in Colombia, we conducted a, a strong strategy of pedagogy and uh, dissemination of the process. But I would have to say, looking now at the, at the result of the plebiscite, as you might know, that the no, we, we submitted the agreement to the, uh, the, the, the vote of the people of Colombia and the no, for the agreement won. So we have always said that maybe we didn't do enough uh, communicating. So there's there's a big challenge in, in communicating. And the other aspect I would want to say and talk about is it's in implementation. You also have to have, I don't know if this is a right translation, but the hopes, you have to have the hopes up. Uh, currently in Colombia, there's a bit of uh, negativity around the process. Mm -hmm. You know, there's with all this killing of the social leaders, there's like this sense of the peace was not real. What we are doing now in, in Fundacion Compass very strongly showing examples of peace happening in the regions, real examples of evidence of ex-combatants working in their communities, regaining back their lives, transforming their communities. This is happening in Colombia of victims forgiving the ones that caused them the harm of regions being transformed. And this is happening. So in the, in the communication um, strategies, these good stories, stories of hope, stories of, of transformation, of uh, common heroes that we have all day with victims yeah. have to be uh, at the front line of the conversation. We cannot le let uh, the bad news and um, uncertainty and um, the the sadness about uh, around the process uh, gain space. You know, there's, this is about positive news and um, making something that many people have said. And you uh, from the European Union and other countries that have experiences in other processes. No one said. No one said that implementing a peace agreement after 50 years of conflict, after 9 million of victims, after all the inequalities and, and, and um, all the challenges that we have in Colombia was going to be easy, neither it was going to be quick. Uh, but there's this um, sense of the need uh, for things to be transformed as soon as the peace agreement was, was uh, accomplished. So I think this communication now in Colombian process Yes. Is the key. Is the key. And, and there's so many spoilers that actually are trying to, to ruin this. Eh? I mean, I'm so in favor of what you say about communication because the messages yeah. of, of hatred, of using social media for, to create division, the, the, the people who own the peace have also to make that happen in their communication strategy. I'm absolutely convinced yeah. of what you're saying. I'm always okay. looking at right because you know we have one minute and a half, and that would I will give the opportunity to Hiba to say a bit. Uh, uh, building on this, what are because this is one question. Some uh, uh, let's say possible good practices and declarations which have been adopted, like uh, the Women uh, Peace and Security Agenda, like the DACA declaration. You know, the, are there some uh, the same reference that could be incorporated into the principles? Absolutely, so I think. Absolutely. In less than one minute, I think, first of all, the Sustaining Peace Agenda provides a very important entry point and, and base for momentum to build and operationalize. And I think this is something that we need to look at. Um, also, uh, there are a lot of good uh, principles and practices uh, within the normative frameworks in the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, in the outcomes of the Youth, Peace and Security Report that the Security Council uh, commissioned uh, some years ago. So there, there are foundations and lessons and normative frameworks that we can build on. The time now is to put that broader frame of reference, to rethink 
and to make to bring the different uh, uh, frames together to provide a, a frame of reference that would enable us to engage in peace processes that are more inclusive, that lays a foundation to lasting peace, that also respond to the aspirations and the expectations of communities so they own them, hold on to them, and keep them over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, here we are. We, we cannot have the time to do more. We will need a lot of time to discuss that. But it has been, for me, also an uh, honor to be one of the mentors of this project. I think uh, worth doing. And, you know, and second, you know, these are principles, but in reality, these are principles also to build an agenda of global governance for peace. And I think mm -hmm. that this is, should be particularly important. It's not a micro operation, it's a, a, a macro operation which mm -hmm. is contributing to the agenda which is promoted by the government. Thank you very much to you. Thank you very much. Please stay in touch. And thank you to all the audience. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.